Hello and welcome to Islava Today, another episode of Islava Today on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hamza Rifa Hassan. Today we're going to be speaking about the future of feminism in Pakistan. What kind of challenges do feminists actually face in a country which is facing high unemployment, a patriarchal structure as far as the society is concerned, and obviously you do have some challenging problems which are socioeconomic in nature. I have with me human rights activist, Khushba Sohail, and we're going to be getting her insights on the future of feminism as both, both as a concept in practice and what can be done to improve women empowerment, uh, you could say a participation and uh, equality within a country such as Pakistan. Pushpa, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Hamza. I'm looking forward to it. All right, Pushpa, let's start off with this question that has the rise of populism in the developing mm -hmm. world, which obviously constitutes Pakistan, had a negative impact on feminist activism? Uh, Hamza, I would say absolutely, right? Um, because, I mean, if you think about the common features of populis populism, there is this sort of construction of a homogenous people, right? There's this sort of idea of an us versus them mentality where, you know, and, and this us is, is sort of a beleaguered, well, I mean, in, in practice, it's a beleaguered majority that feels like because of the way that the world is changing, because of the way that the country might be changing, that they are threatened. Um, and this is problematic for, for feminist principles because populism is generally, you know, especially in the way that it's playing out in the world today, right-wing populism is by its very nature exclusionary. It often goes back to this, you know, it harkens back to this imagined past where, you know, there was this, this idea of this utopia where everything was great and everything was wonderful, but there were specific roles that were set for men and women in this imagined utopia. And it's not necessary that that, you know, that that ever even really existed, but the importance is this sort of you know, this imagined sense of unity, this sense of nationalism, and so on. And, you know, in, de in the developing world in particular, this is one of the things that the right-wing, that right-wing populism is predicated on is the relegation of women to the private sphere, right? This idea that women belong in the house, that they don't belong in the streets, they don't belong in politics, they don't belong, um, you know, outside, essentially, they don't belong in the public sphere. Instead, and they belong in the private sphere of life in order to perpetuate this imagined past where, you know, everything was all good and, you know, everything was, is, it was great. And, and that, and populism, you know, and, and, and right-wing populism is threatened by this new woman who is emerging, you know, this woman who demands equality, this woman who demands her rights, this woman that wants to go to school, this woman that wants to go to university, this woman that wants to go to work this woman that wants um, autonomy, this woman that demands equality and recognition, and this woman that is now willing to go to the streets to demand it. You know, we have these phenomena such as Arth March and so on um, in Pakistan. And Arth March, for those who don't know, is, you know, the Women's March in Pakistan, the Indigenous well, well, Women's yeah. Movement who has come up. Yeah. So, you know, and, and so we have all of these women who are now, and, and, and the thing is that women have demanded these things in the past in Pakistan as well. But now we have this increasingly vocal and increasingly larger group of women that is, is, is quite threatening to populist imaginations and populist right wing. Um, and populism, you know, by its very nature, by its exclusionary nature, wants to pinpoint those that are traitors those that it thinks are, are, are not, you know, that, that don't fall in line with this idea of what the nation should look like. Um, and so these are almost uh, invariably women. But I would take it a step further. I would argue that it's not just in the developing world, but also in the developed world where... Yeah, of course, in the United States, feminism. you have Donald Trump and you have white supremacy. You do have yes. these nativist ideologies, which actually confine women to the household or considered to be, even in some cases, uh, which is very frightening, secondary citizens. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's what populism relegates women to, women to, right, these second-class citizens. And, and like you rightly said, in the United States, for example, Trump um, and, you know, casual misogyny and his idea uh, and his derogatory language around women um, and, you know, and his idea around where women belong in this, in the nation, in the United States of where they should be, um, were quite problematic and quite in contradiction with feminist ideas and feminist principles. So I would say that absolutely, you know, populist movements do have a negative impact on, um, you know, women's rights, on feminist activism, on feminist politics. Um, you know, there's no space for any sort of voices that are different, any sort of voices that challenge dominant narratives when you have this, you know, this rise of populism. It doesn't, it's, it's not, 
conducive to creating a, an environment of critical thinking. Populism demands that you obey, that you agree, that you you know fall in line, essentially. And what we're having um, in Pakistan and in other parts of the world is women who are refusing to fall in line. Let's talk about a few difficult conversations here. Now, in Pakistan, the incidence of child rape, uh, domestic violence, acid attacks, and forced conversions, especially from the minority groups, uh, are rising at an alarming rate. I mean, you uh, almost on a daily basis, you do see GBV or gender-based violence being committed yeah. against a certain segment of the population. And uh, one could argue that, you know, it targets the impoverished segment of the population, but it's pretty much, uh, you know, growing in intensity. How do you think yeah. such menaces can be tackled uh, through feminism in a country like Pakistan? Yeah, let's come in with right with the heart, with the difficult questions, right? Um, yeah, yeah, so, you know, in Pakistan, in Pakistan, these instances are rising, um, you know, and they're being reported a little bit more, especially with the sort of 24-hour news cycle, with this idea that now anybody can report these with social media and so on. Um, and I think that they can they can be tackled through feminism because I see that the roots of a lot of these problems lie in the hyper-masculine patriarchal society that we live in. Rape, domestic violence, acid attacks, forced conversions, all of these have something in common. And what they have in common is this sort of appropriation of power. At their core, it's about power and about dominance, right? When we have men who are committing these acts, it's about asserting that power um, uh, over women, essentially. You know, and 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 this idea that women are are property, essentially, they're nothing more to, than than something to be owned, something to be controlled. Um, and and the thing is, this makes me really. I, I mean, it's it's really sad, and it's it's really depressing also to live um you know in a time where we have all of these cases this you know we have we have this case that that was that is just ongoing a fatma um you know yeah. that 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 child worker who was raped by a very powerful man in um in sin we have the cases where you know in and 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 this is across i mean sexual violence uh, rape child you know uh, child rape child sexual assault all of these things are are uh, popping well, me, up let, in let every me put kind in of society there as well i think you know eve teasing yeah. and harassment would also fall under gbv because sometimes the harassers could actually you know employ violent means to get their own way yeah absolutely i mean absolutely harassment all of these things um at their core stem from a patriarchal and miso a, a patriarchal society that accepts misogyny as you know as something that is just normal right it's what we have is this normalized um you know this normalized masculine hyper masculine toxic patriarchy essentially um and we have this you know and we have these cases popping up in urban centers you know in Islamabad, um that woman who was raped in f9 park you know we have and and there have been so many cases of sexual violence and and uh, that, that happened in Sama that happened all over the country and these are just the reported cases um, you know, because there are so many more that are not reported, as you know, you know, it's sexual violence is something that is so underreported in Pakistan because of the shame, the stigma that is attached to it. And how I think that feminism can help tackle these issues is because feminism at its core, it demands the recognition of the humanity of women um, and the humanity of, 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 of girls, right? So, well, and, and not just of women, but also the human humanity of men as well. I think the sort of common, and, and, I'm, and I'm going off into a tangent here, but I think the sort of common misconception is that women, you know, feminists hate men. Absolutely not, right? Like we think that the patriarchy actually harms men as much as it harms women, right? Because it, it, it perpetuates these ideas of toxic masculinity, these ideas of hyper-masculinity in, in which this environment um, is created. But largely what feminists are arguing for is this recognition of the humanity of women. The reason why all of these things happen is because women are relegated to the space of second-class citizens. Um, and women aren't considered, you know, human beings in these instances, but rather property to be, you know, to, to own and to exert power over. Once you recognize the inherent humanity of women in these situations, it's a lot harder to have these sorts of instances um, that go forward. I mean, and this is not to say that, that, that you know, once you recognize the humanity, everything will be, will be fixed, but rather that we need to change the culture and we need to change the conversation around this. Feminists in Pakistan have been demanding, and you know, to sort of take it to the next level, feminists in Pakistan have been demanding, demanding um, equal access to justice, you know, as you know, 
for example, rape and sexual violence, I mean, there are so few convictions, right? Uh, the, when Even when you go through the legal system, there are so few convictions. It's so underreported. And when it is reported, women are prevented from speaking up and often victim blamed, slut shamed. Um, you know, and, and, and the idea is that there must have been something that that woman did to deserve it. And I want to bring you, you know, I want to remind um, our viewers, which I'm sure you, they heard of, uh, the motorway rape case uh, of last year, right? When we had this woman who was, um, you know, driving and this was, it was late at night and she was driving on the motorway with her two young children and she ran out of fuel and um, she was gang raped yeah, by two men on the side yeah. of the motorway yeah. in yeah. front of her children. And if you remember the first reaction of our you know, of, of the police, for example, we had the CCPO Lahore, um, you know, the capital city police officer Lahore, Omar Sheikh, say that what was she doing outside? What was she yeah. doing so, out so late at night? Was Why was she driving? And Sean, he was actually castigated for that. He was, uh, yeah. you know, the criticism was pretty severe. Yeah, absolutely. But that criticism came um, and was largely perpetuated and propagated by feminists. You know, I mean, this man said it's not like this is France that she thought, thought she could go outside alone. My question is, why does it have to be France? What is the state? What's the point of the state? What is the reason for the state if you can't guarantee the safety of your citizens? Unless you want to say that women are not citizens and don't and aren't accorded the same safety that is promised by the state. The whole concept of a republic, the entire, you know, the entire political treaties is dependent on, okay, I give up some of my liberty in exchange for security that is guaranteed by the state. Yeah, the if the state isn't going to... Exactly. The social contract is, pre is predicated on this. So if you can't guarantee this, and in fact, you're going to shame women and you're going to be like, what was she doing out at that time? Why was she out in the first place? What was she doing? You know, it, it, it's beyond me. And I just want to give you another example. Yeah, please so a few, years, a few years ago, outside my house, um, you know, in Asamba, and, and, and there's, uh, there was a school. And, um, you know, my, my husband was going to work and he saw that there was this woman who was being beat up by her husband in broad daylight. I mean, this is school time, right? So this is like 8 a.m. in the morning. It's sunny outside. There are lots of people. Everyone's there in school. There's, and there's a police officer right there. Um, and this woman is being beat up in public by her husband in front of all these people. And everyone's just walking by. And the police officer is just walking for, watching from a distance. So my husband, he intervened and he went to the police and he's like, why aren't you stopping this? And he goes, which translates into this is this is between the husband and the wife. This is this is a matter of the home. My question is, if a man was assaulting another man in public in front of the police officer, would he have said that this is this is something that is, you know, this is their internal matter. This is a matter oh. that is relegated to the home. We have these kinds of problems in our society, and they start from this very small thing, this very small thing, this idea that if there is, if there is, you know, if there's an altercation between a man and a woman, that it, especially between a husband and a wife, that it should be relegated to the home, that it is their internal matter. It's a private matter. Why is it a private matter? Why should domestic violence be a private matter? And the police officer then tried to convince the woman to make up with her husband. So, 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 you know, and, and it was just beyond me because she went to the police officer then and she tried to report her husband and he was like, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you trying to ruin your, you know, your, your family? Why aren't you just going home? Just make up with him. You know, he's sorry, let it go. It's not your place to do this. Right. I mean, when we have. Yeah, I mean, and it's absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. And this is something that, that is not just with, with the police, right? The police are, are, are part of the system that we live in. They're part of the society that we live in. In our society, we believe to some degree or another that this is a part of life, that women's subjugation is a part of life, that that's the price that she must pay. Um, you know, in her fa as a member of the family in in the society that we live in, and so and I and I really think that this sort of dehumanization, this idea of a woman who should suffer as being the only good woman, as as the only the good woman as the one who is silent. You know, if you think about it, like even the way that we we view women, those who speak up, those who are loud, those who take to the streets, those who speak up, those who 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 say something, um, are bad women. You know, like, so to speak, and I say this in parentheses, in quotation marks, because they're considered, you know, like, let's say, I'm sure you must have, you, you've heard the word fast woman, you know, because they, they are, fast it's considered, woman, yeah. yeah, it's.
let's consider that why are they yeah, complaining well, about something? Progressive. She knows her rights. She knows how to speak up. She knows what justice is about. And uh, they're considered to be fat, which is very unfortunate because that is precisely yeah. the kind of women that could actually initiate social change in the country. Yeah, and we have this idea of a good woman is only the one who suffers in silence. And the second she she speaks up about her suffering, then there's something shameful. Then there's something shameful about her. And we have, you know, and 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 I and this it's this sort of atmosphere that leads to this sort this this impunity by men. This this impunity um, uh, of sexual, uh, t- t- you know, this impunity where when men can commit sexual violence without any sort of real consequences, where they know that the first thing that will be asked is not why men rape, but what she was doing there in the first place, why she was out at night, what was she wearing, who was she with. In the F9 Park incident, um, where a woman was raped, she was with her coworker, she was walking in, in, in the park a few months ago, the first question that was asked was not who raped her or why she was raped. And by the way, this was around 6, 7 p.m., if I'm not wrong, so it wasn't even late at night. Yeah, I mean, around 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The idea was, what was she doing with a male coworker? What was she wearing? Why was she in the park? I mean, these kinds of questions. To the point which that one of the disgusting. perpetrators had the, one of the perpetrators had the audacity to uh, go up to the victim and say, "You shouldn't be here at this time." Exactly. The idea was that because you are here, you deserve to be raped. And I mean that when you have a society that believes this, that women are only safe in their homes. That's when we have these problems. And the worst part is, I mean, this, you know, and the worst part is, is that simply this simply isn't true. When we're talking about abuse, when especially when we're talking about child sexual abuse, but not just child sexual abuse, but, you know, rape, abuse, so on. It's usually in most cases, someone that, you know, it's not, you know, these cases that I've, 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 I've pointed out to you um, have been by strangers, but in most cases, it is by people that you know. It is, there are so many cases where we have sexual abuse by family members um, inside the homes. So when your home isn't safe, where are you supposed to go? When women don't even have the ability or the autonomy, or they're not even safe in their homes, and you know, this entire idea that women will be safe in their homes, um, it's not true. Or women will be safe in, let's say, certain types of clothing things. I want to know, are women in burqas not raped? Is it just women who are out there in jeans and tops that are raped? It's absolutely not true. It's not about what you're wearing. It's not about where you are. But it's rather the, the sickness that is pervasive in patriarchal societies. Um, not just our own, but especially our own, where we have this shame and stigma surrounding women. And that even when a woman fights, even when a woman speaks up, even when a woman puts forth a complaint, she's not believed. The question is, what were you doing? Why were you there? And, 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 and did you do something to deserve this? Did you disobey? Did you not listen to your father, your brother, whoever? Um, it must be on some level your own fault. And I think that's what's most heartbreaking. All right, so absolutely powerful words there, but you know, just to be the devil's advocate uh, here, um, there will be some who would argue that feminism is, you know, a largely idealistic theory in v- environments where, you know, there are more serious problems. I mean, uh, again, I'm just trying to say th- these are not my views. I'm just trying to be the devil's advocate here. Um, where jo- there's joblessness, there's poverty, there's extremism, and all of these, uh, you could say, ills are on the rise. So how do you think feminists can contribute to addressing these harrowing realities? Because uh, a lot of people would actually claim that Fine, women's rights is important, but so is the right to employment. So is the right to uh, be secure. Uh, so is the right to have access to justice or access to property rights. So how do you think feminism can actually fit into this? So, Hamza, I don't think that these are contradictory. I think that, for example, access to justice is a feminist issue. I don't understand why it has to be either or. When we're talking about women's rights, we're not talking about women's rights in a vacuum, right? Um, when we're, t- we're talking about freedom from poverty, freedom from fear, freedom from insecurity for women, because these sorts of problems are multiplied um, for the most vulnerable, who in this case are women. Um, and you know, when we when we talk about, let's say, this the, the newer crop of feminists in the country, but also, you know, feminists that have, and, and feminists that have been in Pakistan um, throughout Pakistan's history, they're not just talking about women's rights in a specific vacuum. 
they are talking about women's rights across the spectrum. Um, if, for example, you look at the Arab marches, you know, if we if you look at these women's marches that have cropped up in all of the urban cities in Pakistan since 2018, um, and you know they have these and they comprise of these younger feminists uh, who are just out there out, out on the streets demanding their rights. If you read their manifestos, if you read their charter of demands from each city every single year, um, you can see that Pakistani feminists believe that me women and, and actually men, too, for that matter, cannot be free until we are all free. And what I mean yeah. by that is, is when we when we talk about freedom, freedom just doesn't just mean freedom from violence. Right. But it does also mean freedom from violence. But what kind of violence? Yeah. Violence um, in all its forms sexual violence, gender-based violence, also extremist violence. Um, if you look at all of their manifestos, you know, all of the art marches in Pakistan have made the connection between the rise in militancy and also the rise in violent extremism and the subjugation and crackdown on women's rights. How can That's we say point. that yeah. extremism isn't a feminist problem? If you look at our neighbors, um, you know, in Afghanistan, the Taliban, one of the first things that they do when they come into power is restrict the rights of women. So how can yeah, we say that these things are not connected? They don't to universities, not have jobs, and to be properly covered up. So yeah, I mean, and the, the, the travesty of all of that is that this is the same Taliban that was there in the 1990s, and suddenly they come into power in 2021, and the, their ideology hasn't changed. Yeah, absolutely. And you see, I mean, there's still there's still people also there, you know, we have right wing elements and we have extremist elements um, in Pakistan as well that believe the same, that also believe that, you know, let's say all of society's ills can be resolved if women don't work or if women don't go to school or, you know, women don't need education. So, ex and, and this is just one example, extremism is a feminist problem as well. Um, poverty is a feminist problem. When we think about poverty, who is most affected? Um, of course, men and women both are affected, but who bears the brunt of that? You know, in, in situations of poverty, for example, um, there is, you know, domestic violence rises as well. Incidences of some domestic violence rises. Um, psychosocial, you know, uh, uh, women have more psychosocial issues. Um, when they don't have in poverty, in joblessness, when women don't have financial autonomy, when they don't have the ability to go out and have that sort of financial freedom, they're also more vulnerable to sexual violence, to violence in yeah. general, to the restriction of their rights. So I think, I think when we when we sort of separate women's rights as something that's out there, that's separate from the rest of the problems that plague Pakistan, I don't think that's true. I think that all of these problems are interconnected. Um, all of these problems are a result of patriarchal and capitalist structures that are predicated on the subjugation of women. Um, when we talk about, you know, when we talk about increased domestic violence, when we talk about increased instances of sexual violence and so on, I mean, all of these things are interconnected. So I, I just I just don't see I just don't see them as, as separate things. I don't think they contradict one another. I think in order to solve these problems, you have to solve all of them together. If you try to solve poverty without addressing gender, you're not really ever going to be able to solve poverty when 50% of this population is female. Um, when 50% of this population suffers under that, right? When you try to solve, you know, gender, you can't address that without also addressing extremism. You can't address these things in, in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So do you think women remain largely disenfranchised in developing countries such as Pakistan? And if that really is the case, then why? Yes, um, um, I, I, I would think so. I mean, I, so if you mean um, disenfranchised in terms of you know, uh, women being able to vote. So sure, legally, you know, w women have that um, and all over the developing world, largely all over the developing world. But even if, and, and I'm going to talk about disenfranchisement in general as well, but even if we're yeah, talking about, yeah, let's say, political... Di oh, okay. So so when we're talking about disenfranchisement um, in, in general as well, absolutely, I do think that um, because we have these sorts of norms, these values, these patriarchal mindsets that actually, you know, that that act as a multiplier, um, and what they do is is they act as a multiplier for gender equality. Um, most of the you know when we have all of these issues in developing countries, you know when we have like for example a lack of access to education, when we have a lack of access to healthcare, this is true for the majority of the population, but it's worse for women. 
right? So when we talk about these problems that developing countries have, they're always exacerbated for women. When we talk about economic autonomy, this is a problem across the board for a large majority of Pakistan, for example. Um, but this is exacerbated in the case of women. Um, women are underrepresented in the decision-making process. Women aren't privy um, of, oftentimes to the decision-making process. They don't have autonomy. They don't have, in a lot of cases, you know, they are, they are unable to exercise that autonomy because of the patriarchal forces um, that exist, uh, you know, in our society and largely in the developing world um, as well. So what we have is, is you know, what we have is if we have a problem of access to justice, for example, if we have a problem of rule of law, all of these things are exacerbated for, for women. Um, if we have, you know, if, if access to justice is the, and, 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 and I'd like to sort of clarify here, right? So when we right. look at, when feminists are looking at these problems, um, you have to look at it not just through the lens of gender, but also through the intersections of gender, class, um, you know, it, you, you, uh, 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 gender, class, or economic background, um, your race, you know, your social background, and so on and so forth. All of these things work together um, well, to create these well. inequalities. Yeah. yeah, and your religion yeah. as well, absolutely. Especially and when we ethnicity. have, you know, majority religions, your ethnicity, your race, your class, your all of these things, your education, your social cultural capital, all of these things um, influence that, yeah. Okay, so first box, since we're running short on time, uh, final question is that, do you think that the Arab March has had a significant impact on mobilizing change in Pakistan? And is there like this palpable effect that you actually see? Or is this more of an elitist venture? Because a lot of people would claim that the Me Too movement is being, and again, I'm being the devil's advocate over here, uh, because I think that the Me Too movement is absolutely fantastic. It's high time to call out sexual harassment cases. It's high time to call out people who do commit these crimes against humanity. But there is also this view that, you know, Arat Mat is in a country such as Pakistan, where the majority of women actually live in poverty, uh, remains an elitist venture. Uh, do you subscribe to that view? Um, so no, I do not ascribe to that view. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad um, that you brought up this question, because I think that this is a misconception that is, um, you know, that is rampant across uh, a lot of, I mean, a lot of circles, right? So I do think that the art marches have absolutely changed the view and the landscape of, of women's rights in Pakistan. Because what, what the art marches have done is that they've started a conversation that did not previously exist, right? So what we have is now finally in the public sphere, we have these, we have women who are on the streets who are demanding autonomy and not just autonomy. They're also talking about all kinds of things. Like I mentioned, um, you know, in my previous thing, in, in my, in the previous question that you asked, um, they're talking about gender, but they're also talking about militancy. They're also talking about rising extremism. They're also talking about climate change. They're also talking about um, poverty. They're also Sexual talking feminism. about joblessness. Yeah. Yeah, 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 they're all they're talking about all of these things, right? And 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 one of the you know one of the the slogans from the Art March is you know hum chin ke lenge azadi. and the idea is if you don't give it to us, we will snatch this yeah, freedom from you because it's our right. That as well. Yeah, yeah. If you don't if you don't give us this freedom, we will snatch it from you um, if mm -hmm. we have to, right? And 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 in you know and and we ha and and this idea, um, I think that that the, the, the RF March is an elite movement. To address that, I think that there's two things that I wanna address. Um, yeah, sure. First, one thing that's undeniable is that the RF Marches are so far an urban movement. So what we have is that these RF Marches have popped up since 2018 in urban centers. Initially, they were in Karachi, Lahore, and Islamabad. They spread in some form or another to Multan, to Faisalabad, to Quetta, to Peshawar, right? To Hyderabad. So we had all of these other cities also, but still relatively urban centers um, where women are, you know, speaking up in some way or another and coming out on March 8th uh, to demand, um, you know, their rights and to demand the freedom that is due to them. So one thing um, I think that is that's undeniable is that it is a largely urban movement rather than a rural movement. However, um, you know, this idea that it's an elite movement um, is not true because even in urban centers, we have so many women from different social classes that are represented in the art marches. However, that said, because of the way that 
you know, digital media works because of the way that social media plays out and because of the way, uh, because of the language of social media, those women that are most often highlighted both in the news and in social media are those who have access to these tools and to these and, and, and understand the way that the game works on social media, that understand how hashtags work, that understand how, which, you know, which pictures are going to get, let's say, mo most traction and so on. Um, and also because it is often Often those women who have relatively more privilege that are able to use that privilege to appear um, in public spaces, whereas a lot of other women don't have um, have that luxury, right? However, that's not to say that those women aren't part of the process. All of the art marches um, have, you know, basically mobilized within and also have connections to working class uh, women throughout the country. So all of the art marches are connected to, let's say, home-based workers. They're connected to nurses. They're connected to folks um, in, in, in the slum areas. You know, they're connected to women in the slum areas. If you look domestic at all workers. of the manifesto, yeah, yeah. Of, of domestic workers, absolutely. If you look at all of the manifestos, if you look at, and, and you know, each art march comes out with its own manifesto. I think there's this idea that this the art march is some sort of centrally organized NGO, but it's absolutely not, right? Each city has had its sort of spontaneous movement pop up um, uh, in this, in a way that it seems like it's coordinated, but rather it's very, it's a very loose coordination. It's rather where each city is in each city, there's this sort of, you know, movement that's popped up to address all of these problems. And each city comes up with its own manifesto, own charter of demands. And all of those demands, that manifesto is not just aimed at women, um, privileged women, but rather it addresses the problems of domestic workers. For example, Affordable housing has been one of the major demands of all of the art marches since their inception. Um, affordable housing is a feminist issue because, as we talked about, you know, when we talk, when when, it, when women who are the ones that suffer the most when they're when they don't have affordable housing, um, it's women. Of course, men suffer as well. But when we're talking about you know rising incidences of domestic violence, when we're talking about women who have to who are then put in exploitative labor conditions, it's 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 women who bear the brunt of that. Um, all of the art marches talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, freedom, the, the idea to, the ability to express themselves both publicly um, and politically, right? So what we have is in these demands, also environmental demands, you know, so, so we have demands from stu for students as well. It's not just about, you know, it's not just elite women's demands. It's, it's instead demands that are aimed towards bettering the conditions, the material conditions of the majority of women in Pakistan, um, which are, of course, working class women, we, the majority of women in Pakistan. So if we're talking, for example, minimum wage, a, a livable minimum wage it has been a demand throughout all of the art marches um, throughout through, you know, throughout since Art March began um, in 2018, who does this affect? Livable minimum wage is for those women who are out there as domestic workers who are exploited um, in the homes of 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 the elite, right? So it's not just um, it, you know, it's 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 absolutely not true that that it's just uh, elite women. We have working class women, and you know, there's this there's if you look at the speeches that happen at the art marches, you will have women from all kinds of communities. You'll have women coming in from slums talking about their issues. Um, and their issues are, for example, you know, from last year, there was there were women that there was a woman who came in um, at the Islamabad uh, one, or it was the year before that there was a woman who came in and she talked about um, basically the CDA raising the slums and how that was a feminist issue and that was her biggest issue right now that she doesn't have a place to live that her that her that her children don't have a place to live um, that you know and she, and and she told us you know she told us that she spent her blood sweat and tears building this house you know and it's a mud house but it's it was something that was her own and even that cost her so much and then when when it was knocked down she had to start from scratch all over again this is a feminist issue for her um, as well. You know, so so it's a, it's about the rights of all women. It's about the rights of working women. It's about the rights of, of domestic workers. It's about the rights of nurses. It's about the rights of lady health workers. It's about the rights of students. Um, the Aarith marches are, by their very nature, inclusionary, or they try to be, to the best of their, you know, ability. They try to be inclusionary in order to make sure that the largest 
number of women and the lar- the issues that are faced by the largest number of women um, are addressed in, 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 in the demands in the manifesto. Um, but I think especially with the way that sensationalist uh, television works, uh, you know, especially in, in, in our country, um, those sorts of things aren't highlighted. And, and what I find is that a lot of people just don't read the manifestos, but instead just see, you know, you see pictures of a couple of women in Western clothes and it's like, oh, OK, this is some sort of a, a foreign agenda when well, that's not the case. We've had so many sure. indigenous women. Um, pop up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know that we're running out of time. I could keep talk about no, this. No, forever, right, so I'll, right. let, I'll hand it over to you. No, no, it's absolutely fantastic. Human rights activist, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. So that's all that we have for Islamabad today on Think Tech Hawaii. You can follow us on our social media pages and do provide us with your valuable feedback. Until next time, take care. Mm-hmm.